Hello, this is part two in OCT Basics, Interference and Coherence. My name is Mark Brzezinski. This slide shows um, part of my background and it's been discussed in previous pre presentations in depth, so I'm not going to go into detail here. Uh, for those who want a more depth understanding of OCT, um, I refer to my book. Uh, chapters 1 and through 4 are college level or possibly even high school level uh, physics and may be useful for those who are interested. Chapters 5 through 11 um, people may be able to get through, but they're primarily were um, designed to work out um, much of the classical physics we use in OCT. Well, what will we be covering? Um, briefly, the properties of light in about three slides. Um, we'll go over that brief overview of OCT LCI that was in part one. Coherence and interference, why we need a reference arm, what determines axial resolution and how do we measure axial resolution? And the Fourier transform, um, which is critical in understanding OCT and how it relates to resolution. We're going to focus on uh, time domain to learn the principles, uh, but both to understand time domain and spectral domain, including SSOCT, uh, we need to understand the concepts of Fourier transforms. So light is an electromagnetic wave. It's a wave. Um, uh, to be more precise, uh, we treat it um, when a lot of our papers are quantum mechanical and we treat it as a photon and at high photon numbers it the photons that have uh, wave-like behavior, but you don't really need to know that for the sake of this presentation, light is a wave. And from Maxwell's equations in the mid 1800s, a changing electric field produces a magnetic field and a changing magnetic field produces an electric field, which leads to um, a propagation of energy electromagnetic energy through space. Um, so, um, also, um, light is, is generally reserved, the term, to describe the visible re region of um, electromagnetic radiation, but we're going to broaden it. And so, uh, the category of electromagnetic radiation is determined by the frequency or wavelength in a vacuum. And OCT actually operates in the near infrared. It doesn't operate in the visible region. You can't see an OCT beam, whether it's the 830 wavelength used in ophthalmology or 1300 nanometers used in all other applications. Uh, this is a very important slide in OCT history. It was discussed in the first presentation. And um, I personally used it to decide to go after OCT imaging and non-transparent tissue. This was not done by our group or any of our collaborators. Um, but uh, penetration is determined by absorption and scattering. And the green line shows 830 where uh, OCT is performed in the eye, and this is the liver, so scattering would be much less in the eye at 830. But um, based on this data, we believe that around 1300 nanometers, both scattering and absorption would be low. This is of liver, and that turned out to be the case. And so the first non-scattering uh, tissue paper uh, these images were in. And you can see imaging in epiglottis with the histology on the bottom. 
at 1300 nanometers you can see through um, the el elastic cartilage where at 850 nanometers the penetration isn't even 500 microns. Before getting into the principles of OCT, a simple question is why does refl light reflect back? So sound reflects based on differences in acoustical impedance. Light reflects back because of differences in refractive index and um, in particle in particles or planes with refractive index, the shape and size. So uh, refractive index refers to the speed of light in a medium. And if an interface consists of two materials that have the same reflective index, the light will just penetrate through. And this is going to be covered again uh, in more detail in a future video. Uh, what is needed to perform OCT or L L L LCA? Well, first, I, um, they're both based on low coherent interferometry. OCT is just two-dimensional LCI or three-dimensional LCI. And you need a reference arm, and we'll discuss why. Um, you need a source with a Gaussian or bell-shaped frequency distribution. And this is critical, and we'll discuss why this is. Uh, you want broadband. You, it needs to contain a wide range of frequencies or wavelengths, which makes it low coherent light. Uh, and the, based on what we've already said, it needs to be in the infrared. So going again back to the uh, superficial explanation we used in the first set of uh, in part one, OCT is analogous to ultrasound measuring the intensity of back reflected infrared light rather than acoustical waves. In this presentation, we're going to look at the limitations of that definition because we're not actually measuring the back reflection of light. We're inter measuring the interfer interferogram between the sample arm and the reference arm. And hopefully that will become more clear by the end of this talk. So sticking with that definition now, uh, for now we'll assume pulses are generated the sample but we've moved forward in our understanding of OCT we really the majority of OCT sources are low coherent light but um, some of the sources we've used at MIT are uh, femtosecond lasers which are pulsed sources and if you imagine a pulse going into the tissue uh, the time for the pulse to be reflected back or echo delay time is used to measure distances. The intensity of back reflection, the number of photons reflecting back is plotted as a function of depth. The beam is then scanned across the sample to produce two and three dimensional data sets. Due to the high speed associated with the propagation of light, the echo delay time cannot be measured electronically. That's why we need to use a reference arm and low coherence interferometry light in one second goes around the earth four times. So here's the diagram we showed in lecture one. And so briefly using the pulse analogy, um, if a pulse came from that low coherent source through the beam splitter, half the light went down the sample arm, half the light went down the referenced arm to in the reference arm there's a mirror moving back and forth changing the path length in that reference arm. So any reflection from the sample that's traveled the same distance as the reflection in the reference arm where that mirror is positioned at that given time um, will meet at the beam splitter and interfere. And OCT measures the interferogram and we'll discuss why that is later, but this is really the skeleton schematic of the original OCT systems we started off with. It used a mirror in the sample arm 
with a galvanometer that changed the distance over a three to five millimeter range and that gave you imaging within your sample of three to five millimeters. So coherence and interference are important concepts in OCT. But before getting to them, I just want to introduce a term CW or continuous wave, which means constant intensity um, as distinct from pulsed light. And we'll get into that a little bit more detail. It doesn't mean the frequency patterns, frequency distribution within the beam remains constant, and it doesn't, but the intensity of the beam remains constant, which is CW, as opposed to pulse, which is, um, um, you know, for instance, has a bell-shaped curve intensity. So um, coherence is a complicated topic. If you look in a dictionary, the, it would say the situation when um, the parts of something fit together in a natural way. So it involves multiple things. And roughly, the degree of correlations in flu light fluctuations of two interfering beams is coherence. Um, interference, when you combined two or more waveforms, the resultant displacement or amplitude is either reinforced or canceled. Um, and stated another way, the combination either results or increase or decrease in intensity, depending on the alignment of peaks and troughs. So if we look at the two cosine or sine waves um, in the bottom image, they're slightly out of phase, so they won't add up to either total constructive or destructive interference. And We'll be using a lot more waves when we actually perform OCT imaging, but you can understand that if it's completely out of phase, you'll get total destructive interference, and it's completely in phase, you'll get complete constructive interference, so the signal will be doubled. I just wanted to illustrate a pulse. So when we talk about pulses, that's the amplitude of the signal, the intensity. But within that amplitude, there's a carrier frequency. And at this point, I'm going to repeat numerous times. So when you And it's going to be seen in the next slide. When you have a single wavelength that's infinite in length, to have a pulse, you have to have the combination of many wavelengths to have a single pulse. Actually, you have to have an infinite number of wavelengths over a given range. And um, within that amplitude, there's a, fluc a faster fluctuation. And this faster fluctuation is um, the carrier signal. And we use it for things like uh, the Doppler signal. It also is helpful with noise. But so there's a faster signal, which relates to the overlapping of the frequencies and then the amplitude of that faster signal um, we refer to as the pulse. So now we could um, have a single frequency that is CW shown here and we're going to see why that's a problem in interference. So this is not useful for ranging or we can have a pulse which has a finite um, uh, uh, existence in space or time. Um, and again, pulses are created by more than one uh, frequency. So why do we need a reference arm? So this is an interfer interferogram. It's the interference between two arms when the light is traveled um, the same distance. So the intensities are much higher. And it allows us to adjust to the speed of light because light is traveling the speed of light in both arms. But this amplitude is what we're actually measuring. And the car we, don't, we can't measure directly the carrier frequency. So if we were to put this now in an interferometer, and um, this is one of our earlier papers from 2000, 
uh, I think neoplasia is now a journal of nature. But if we were to use in this interferometer, um, and all of, essentially all OCT is done in this type of interferometer, it's called a Michelson interferometer. So light is released from the source, it's split, it goes to the sample and reference arm, and then it reflects back and then it hits the detector. So let's say we start off with light with a long coherence length and it, it's um, a, a single frequency. Now, technically anything that's a single frequency, and this is both mathematically and in the physical world has to be infinite in length but let's just assume for the sake of our measuring ability it's a single frequency we split it we send it down is it useful in ranging no because as we move that reference arm mirror we're going to get very rapid um, uh, constructive destructive over very tiny distances. And so we're just gonna see a static signal. And so it, it's of no use in ranging. What we need is a signal that's concentrated over a very small area. So if we look at our short coherence length, and this is a pulse, and we're gonna go over short coherence length CW later in the talk, but let's just take our pulse. So let's say this is a very, very short pulse. Let's say it's five femtosecond. So we send it down the beam splitter, reflects off of some part of the sample, some place within the sample. Uh, and the light that's traveled the same distance to the reference arm will interfere only if it travels the same distance to within the duration of the pulse. So very long, wide pulses, very long pulses have lower resolution. I know that's somewhat of a difficult concept if you're being introduced to it for the first time, but you, um, if you had a, a femtosecond pulse, then the reference arm pulse to generate interference has to come back within a femtosecond. And so when femtosecond, um, is 10 to the minus 15 seconds. And so you see how we're beating the speed of light. We're dealing with numbers that are very, very small. Uh, so the shorter the coherence length or pulse length, then the higher the resolution. So resolution and when I, this resolution we're talking about right now is the axial resolution. The axial resolution is the resolution that's a function of depth, going the light going into the tissue. There's also a lateral resolution, which is the lateral resolution is a dependent for the sake of these discussion on the lenses or the ability to focus, which is different than the bandwidth need uh, dependence of the axial resolution. This will be dealt with in a different talk. It's particularly relevant to endoscopes and catheters, and so it'll be dealt with in that particular talk. So uh, the axial resolution is com controlled by the coherence length of the source. So the, the bandwidth of light, of frequencies, uh, within the light, or when we're looking at a pulse, the pulse duration, where we measure the duration from isn't critical. But let's say we're measuring the reflection off of a mirror. A mirror would be, for all practical purposes, an infinitely thin interface, but we're only gonna see it like we see this peak on the bottom to within the pulse width. That's the maximum resolution you can have. Uh, you can't get below the width of the resolution of the pulse width. So um, we refer to this when we measure the interference off of a mirror, for instance, as the point spread function. That it determines our resolution. It defines our resolution.
Um, so coherence length can be viewed as the pulse length, or with the CW pulse, uh, it's the period over which the beam is constant. And I'm going to go back to this later in the talk. Most OCT sources are not pulsatile, are um, tie sapphire laser, chromium, uh, forced right lasers, uh, femtosecond lasers, they are pulses, but they're the exception to the rule. The, can, the clinical sources are CW sources. So then how do you get this um, small area like we saw with a pulse? Well, the, what, the characteristics of the beam over, let's say, 8 femtoseconds is constant. But then after that 8 seconds, it's no longer constant again. So when we split the beam and it comes back, it's acting like a pulse because it'll only interfere over that small region where the frequencies and phases of the light within that CW, that constant amplitude beam, match up. So um, difficult concept if you've never been introduced to it before, but um, most OCT pulses are CW and broad bandwidth, and so they have a very short coherence length that allows very high resolution. And again, and I keep repeating the topic, the coherence length, even in a uh, CW source, is inversely proportional to the bandwidth of the light source. In other words, the shorter the pulse or the shorter the coherence length, um, you'll need more frequencies, a broader range of frequencies to get it. Now, we need to get a pulse, we need to add up multiple frequencies. And so we're, this is our basic introduction to Fourier mathematics. And so I included a formula on the bottom. It's not critical to understand the formula. It's part of a series. It's actually part of a Fourier series. But if we start off with a sine wave, we you can see where it says sine x term. Then we add a second term um, that's a higher frequency. Sine 3 to the x would be a higher term. And then sine um, 5x would be a higher frequency term because the oscillations are greater. And you can see that in the picture. And as you start adding that up, you're ending up with a pulse wave or square wave and an inverse square wave, depending on which side of the zero point you're on. So to produce a square wave, we need to keep adding up frequencies in order to get that. And that's seen here. This was a modified, or the numbers actually come from uh, Hex Textbook of Optics, which I strongly recommend to any, anyone interested in the optics. Uh, this was from a long ago, the fourth edition. But if we look at the graphs, um, the top A. So what we see is we're using a few frequencies in um, in our graph. And in our insert, these few frequencies end up giving us um, close together pulse waves or square waves. Now, as we increase the number of frequencies by and that's indicated in B by the number of vertical lines. We see that the uh, pulses become separated. So as the pulses become separated, uh, the pulses will become separated because we're using more frequencies. And then in the bottom one, C, we use even more frequencies and the pulses become more and more separated. So now, if you can imagine, we use an infinite range of frequencies in, over our Gaussian area, then we're only going to end up with a single pulse. So in order to get a single pulse, you need an infinite number of frequencies. I hope that's starting to make sense.
and this shows a, a part of a Fourier series. So I wanted to include the carrier series because the previous just showed the amplitude. So we have we had square pulses last time, but we're really going to have these are more Gaussian pulses in shape or bill shaped, but they have a carrier frequency associated with them, which is what's realistic in light. We only measure the envelope, the bell shaped here, but um, there's a carrier frequency which has um, important implications. This is figure 1.8 from my book, by the way. Um, and again, we use the carrier frequency for things like Doppler. So Fourier relationships, this is important. It's going to be important in future talks on um, not just time domain OCT, but Fourier domains or spectral OCT, SSOCT, uh, spectral radar, whatever spectral technique you're discussing. So the top is a Fourier series. It has a, f um, it doesn't have an infinite number of wavelengths over um, a given range. And so it yields a series of pulses or a series of square waves, whereas a Fourier integral has an infinite number of wavelengths. And I'm sorry for giving you equations, but the T is time and the V is frequency. So what the top equation is saying is that um, if we have um, the integral, this integral, which is what that S shape sig sign gives us uh, over infinity, we have an infinite number of frequencies. It gives us our the Fourier transform of which is going to be our pulse or square wave or other shape in time. And the reverse holds. The Fourier transform of the shape, the pulse, the you know, the bell-shaped curve, the square wave is going to give an infinite number of frequencies and whether it's a square wave or whether it's a um, Gaussian pulse, it's going to depend on the distribution of frequencies and their amplitudes. So one really, really important point is that um, we need to have a Gaussian distribution. The Fourier transform of the Gaussian distribution is another Gaussian distribution. So the left and um, the y-axis in both is the normalized intensity. The left is the wavelength and the right is the length of the pulse and time. And so the left shows the frequencies, the right shows the amplitude pulse. Minus, of course, the carrier frequency. So again, the reflection off of a mirror um, we wouldn't see an infinitely thin line. We could only see, resolve it to the coherence length, and the coherence length of a Gaussian function is Gaussian. And so, uh, so it's going to have a finite shape. Now, why does it need to be Gaussian? Well, if we have a square wave, then we have side lobes. And um, there are several problems associated with this, but um, one of them is that for each one of these pulses reflected back, we want to associate it with a pixel in an image. So this just shows the pixelation, and you've seen pixelation before, for instance, on your television sets or on monitors. So let's say a point in tissue corresponds to a place on the image in a given pixel. We can't have side lobes uh, because we have a non-Gaussian spectrum where we have these side lobes showing up in other pixels. It just increases our signal to noise ratio and appears as other structures. So I'm just going to go over again this concept of low coherence um, CW, low coherence interferometry. And so ima now imagine, first on top again, this is from my book, we just have two frequencies. And uh, 
they're slightly out of phase. So this particular beam, if we did a measurement at B and we did a measurement at D, it would give us identical results. Now, as we add more frequencies, even though we're going to keep it a constant intensity, um, and the frequencies have different phases, and we're not changing the frequencies at all, but we're just changing the phases for illustration here, we see that the only place where we make a measurement that it's constant is at C and D. So C and D are essentially identical when we add them up. But if we were to make the measurement at A and compare it to C, it would be different. If we made the measurement at E and compare it to C, it would be different. But by com if comparing the measurements at C and D, we're going to get the same measurement. And so we talked about the fact that in the reference and sample arm, we want the smallest uh, pulse possible or when we're using CW fingerprint, the range over which the, um, the beam is constant. So the smaller the range over which the beam is constant, the higher the resolution we can get. And from this slide, you can see by adding more frequencies, and we actually just added more phases, but um, it, the same thing would have worked if we lined them all up but used different frequencies then uh, we are making it smaller and smaller that coherence length. So then when we go down our sample, even though it's a CW beam, it will only produce an interferogram, interfere when uh, the reference and sample arm signals meet and have traveled to within the coherence time or the coherence length. And you may ask, the question of conservation of energy. So how do you get total destructive interference? Energy can't be created or destroyed. Well, if the detector reads no energy, then all the direction energy was redirected at the light source. So it has to do with the phase in the beam splitter. Whereas if the beam detector registers a maximal signal, then no light is redirected back to the source. All right, that was difficult. And, um, you know, much of our, here's much of the team that was involved in our early work with OCT. Uh, I hope this was useful. I know it's a difficult topic. For those who are really interested, try to go over it a few times or look in the first four chapters of my textbook. I'm not familiar with another source who tries to go over the basics of OCT physics at this level. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank the NIH for the 12 or so grants that it's uh, funded our lab with. Thank you.